This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. I think the most beautiful motion of a robot has to be the passive dynamic walkers. I think there's just something fundamentally beautiful. The ones in particular that Steve Collins built with Andy Rowena at Cornell, a 3D walking machine. So it was not confined to a boom or a plane that you put it on top of a small ramp, give it a little push. It's powered only by gravity, no controllers, no batteries whatsoever. It just falls down the ramp. And at the time it looked more natural, more graceful, more human-like than any robot we'd seen to date, powered only by gravity. How does it work? Well, okay, the simplest model, it's kind of like a slinky. It's like an elaborate slinky. Um, one of the simplest models we used to think about it is actually a rimless wheel. So imagine taking a, a bike, bicycle wheel, but take the rim off. So it's now just got a bunch of spokes. If you give that a push, it still wants to roll down the ramp, but every time its foot, its spoke comes around and hits the ground, it loses a little energy. Every time it takes a step forward, it gains a little energy. Those things can come into perfect balance and actually they, they want to, it's a stable phenomenon. If it's going too slow, it'll speed up. If it's going too fast, it'll slow down and it comes into a stable periodic motion. Now you can take that rimless wheel, which doesn't look very much like a human walking, take all the extra spokes away, put a hinge in the middle. Now it's two legs. That's called our compass gate walker. That can still, you give it a little push, it starts falling down a ramp, looks a little bit more like walking, at least it's a biped. But what Steve and Andy and Ted McGear started the whole exercise, but what Steve and Andy did was they took it to this beautiful conclusion where they built something that had knees, arms, a torso, the arms swung naturally, uh, give it a little push, and that it looked like a stroll through the park. How do you design something like that? I mean, is that art or science? It's on the boundary. I think there's a science to getting close to the solution. I think there's certainly art in the way that they they made a beautiful robot. But um, but then the finesse, because because this was work, they were working with a system that wasn't perfectly modeled, wasn't perfectly controlled. There's all these little tricks that you have to tune the suction cups at the knees, for instance, so that they stick, but then they release at just the right time. Or there's all these little tricks of the trade, which really are art. But it was a point. I mean, it made the point. And we were at that time, the walking robot, the best walking robot in the world was Honda's Asimo. Absolutely marvel of modern engineering. It Is this could, 90s? This was in 97 when they first released it, sort of announced P2, and then it went through. It was Asimo by then in 2004. Um, <laughs> it gets a bad rap. Asimo is a beautiful machine. It does walk with its knees bent. Our Atlas walking had its knees bent, but actually Asimo was pretty fantastic, but it wasn't energy efficient. Neither was Atlas when we worked on Atlas. Um, none of our robots have, that have been that complicated have been very energy efficient, but there was a, there's a thing that happens when you do control, when you try to control a system of that complexity. You try to use your motors to basically counteract gravity. Take whatever the world's doing to you and push back, erase the dynamics of the world and impose the dynamics you want because you can make them simple and analyzable, mathematically simple. And this was a very sort of beautiful example that you don't have to do that. You can just let go, let physics do most of the work right? And you just have to give it a little bit of energy. This one only walked down a ramp. It would never walk on the flat. To walk on the flat, you have to give a little energy at some point. But maybe instead of trying to take the forces imparted to you by the world and replacing them, what we should be doing is letting the world push us around and we go with the flow. Very zen, very zen robot. I, think it I don't know if it's thousands, but... Uh, it's a lot. It takes some patience. There's no question. So in that sense, control might help a little bit. Oh, the abs I think everybody, even at the time, said that the answer is to do with that with control. But it was just pointing out that maybe the way we're doing control right now 
isn't the way we should. I do have a favorite example. Okay. <laughs> so it sort of goes with the passive walking idea. So is there, you know, how, how energy efficient are animals? Okay, there's a great series of experiments by George Lauder at Harvard and Mike Tranafilo at MIT. They were studying fish swimming in a water tunnel, mm -hmm. okay? And one of these, the type of fish they were studying were these rainbow trout because they, there was a phenomenon well understood that rainbow trout, when they're swimming upstream at mating season, they kind of hang out behind the rocks. And it looks like, I mean, that's tiring work swimming upstream. They're hanging out behind the rocks. Maybe there's something energetically interesting there. So they tried to recreate that. They put in this water tunnel, a rock, basically a cylinder that had the same sort of vortex street, mm -hmm. the eddies coming off the back of the rock that you would see in a stream. And they put a real fish behind this and watched how it swims. And the amazing thing is that if you watch from above what the fish swims when it's not behind a rock, it has a particular gait. You can identify the fish the same way you look at a human looking at walking down the street, you sort of have a sense of how a human walks the fish has a characteristic gait. You put that fish behind the rock, its gait changes. And what they saw was that it was actually resonating and kind of surfing between the vortices. Yeah. Now, here was the experiment that really was the clincher because there was still, it wasn't clear how much of that was mechanics of the fish, how much of that is control, the brain. So the clincher experiment, and maybe one of my favorites to date, although there are many good experiments, they took, they, this was now a dead fish. Um, they took a dead fish. <laughs> they put a yeah. string that went, that tied the mouth of the fish to the rock so it couldn't go back and get caught in the grates. Uh, and then they asked, what would that dead fish do when it was hanging out behind the rock? And so what you'd expect, it sort of flopped around like a dead fish in the, in the vortex wake until something sort of amazing happens. And this video is worth putting in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. What happens? Uh, the dead fish basically starts swimming upstream, right? It's completely dead, no brain, no motors, no control, but it somehow the mechanics of the fish resonate with the vortex street and it starts swimming upstream. It's one of the best examples ever. I understand the question. That's the reason. I mean, do they co-evolve? Um, yeah, somehow co. Yeah, like I, I don't know if an environment can evolve, but um, I mean, there are experiments that people do, careful experiments that show that um, animals can adapt to unusual situations and recover efficiency. So there seems like at least in one direction, I think there is reason to believe that the animal's motor system um, and probably its mechanics uh, adapt in order to be more efficient. But efficiency isn't the only goal, of course. Um, sometimes it's too easy to think about only efficiency, but we have to do a lot of other things first, not get eaten. And then all other things being equal, try to save energy. By the way, let's, uh, draw a distinction between control and mechanics. Like how, how can you, how would you define each? Yeah. I mean, I, I think part of the point is that we shouldn't draw a line right. as, as, as clearly as we tend to, but the, you know, on a robot, we have motors and we have the links of the robot, let's say. If the motors are turned off, the robot has some passive dynamics, okay? Gravity does the work. You can put springs, I would call that mechanics, right? If we have springs and dampers, which our muscles are springs and dampers and tendons. Um, but then you have something that's doing active work, putting energy in, which are your motors on the robot. The controller's job is to send commands to the motor that add new energy into the system, right? So. The mechanics and control interplay somewhere the divide is around you know did you decide to uh, send some commands to your motor or did you just leave the motors off and let them do their work it's both but i think we maybe have underestimated how important the dynamics are right um i mean even our bodies the mechanics of our bodies of certainly with exercise they evolve but uh, so i actually i lost a finger in early 2000s mm -hmm. and um, it's my fifth metacarpal and it turns out you use that a lot um, in ways you don't expect when you're opening jars even when i'm just walking around if i bump it on something there's a bone there that was used to taking uh, contact 
my fourth metacarpal wasn't used to taking contact. It used to hurt. It still does a little bit. But actually, my bone has remodeled, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, over, the la over a couple of years, the geometry, the mechanics of that bone changed to address the new circumstances. So the idea that somehow it's only our brain that's adapting or evolving is, is not right. No, I mean, there's a bunch of animals that do it a bit. A bit. Uh, there's a, I think we are the most successful biped. Yeah, I, there are some great books written about evolution of walking, evolution of the human body. I think it's easy though to make bad evolutionary arguments. Sure. Um, <laughs> Most of them are probably bad, but what, what, what else can we do? I mean, I think um, a lot of what dominated our evolution probably was not the things that worked well sort of in the steady state, um, uh, you know, when things are, when things are good. But, but uh, for instance, people talk about what we should eat now because our ancestors were meat eaters or, or whatever. Oh yeah, I love that. Yeah, but probably you know the reason that one pre uh, pre Homo sapiens species versus another survived was not because of whether they ate well uh, when there was lots of food, but when the ice age came, you know, probably one of them happened to be in the wrong place. One of them happened to uh, forage a food that was okay, even even when the the glaciers came or something like that. I mean. There's a oh, great walking. book, by the way, um, well, a series of books by Nicholas Taleb about Fooled by Randomness and Black Swan. Um, highly recommend them. But yeah, they make the point nicely that probably it was a few random events that, yes, yeah. maybe it was uh, someone getting hit by a rock, as you say. Uh the most, um, I mean, the reason I spent a long time working on wa bipedal walking was because it was hard and it was, um, it challenged control theory in ways that I thought were important. Um, I wouldn't have I ever tried to convince you that, um, you should start a company around bipeds or something like this. There are people that make pretty compelling arguments, right? I think the most compelling one is that the world is built for the human form. And if you want a robot to work in the world we have today, then, you know, having a human form is a pretty good way to go. Um, and there are, there are places that a biped can go that would be hard for, uh, other form factors to go, even natural places. But, um, you know, at some point in the long run, we'll be building our environments for our robots probably. And so maybe that argument falls aside. <laughs> Well, you know, it happened the other way, right? So I was studying walking robots and uh, I was, there's a great conference called the Dynamic Walking Conference, uh, where it brings together both the biomechanics community and the walking robots community. And so I had been going to this for years and hearing talks by people who study barefoot running and other, the mechanics of running. So I, I did eventually read Born to Run. Most people <laughs> read Born to Run in the first, then, yeah. right? Um, the other thing I had going for me is actually that I, uh, I wouldn't, I wasn't a runner before and I learned to run after I had learned about barefoot running or I mean, started running longer distances. So I didn't have to unlearn and I'm definitely, um, I'm a big fan of it for me, but I'm not going to, I tend to not try to convince other people. There's people who run beautifully with shoes on and that's good. Um, but it, here's why it makes sense for me. Um, it's all about the long-term game, right? So I, th I think it's just too easy to run 10 miles, feel pretty good, and then you get home at night and you realize, uh, my knees hurt, I did something wrong, right? Um, if you take your shoes off, then is, if you hit hard with your foot at all, um, then it hurts. <laughs> you don't like run 10 miles uh, and, then, and then realize you've done something, some damage. You have immediate feedback, Mm -hmm. telling you that you've done something that's that's maybe suboptimal and you change your gait. I mean, it's even subconscious. If I right now, having run many miles barefoot, if I put a shoe on, my gait changes in a way that I think is not as good. Um, so 
So it, it makes me land softer. And I think my, my goals for running are to do it for as long as I can into old age, um, not to win any races. And so for me, this is a, a, you know, a way to protect myself. Slowly. <laughs> That's the biggest thing people do is they are excellent runners and they're used to running long distances or running fast and they take their shoes off and they hurt themselves instantly trying to do something that they were used to doing. I, I think I lucked out in the sense that I, I couldn't run very far when I first started trying. And I run with minimal shoes too. I mean, I will, uh, you know, bring along a pair of actually like aqua socks or something like this. I can just slip on or uh, running sandals. I've tried all of them. What's the difference between a minimal shoe and nothing at all? What's like feeling wise? What does it feel like? There is a, I mean, I, I noticed my gait changing, right? So, um, I mean, your, your foot has as many muscles and sensors as your hand does, right? Sensors. Ooh, Okay. And uh, we do amazing things with our hands and we stick our foot in a big solid shoe, right? So there's, I think, you know, when you're barefoot, you're, you're just giving yourself more proprioception. And that's why you're more aware of some of the gait flaws and stuff like this. Now you have less protection too. So, um, rocks and stuff. I mean, that... yeah. So, so I think people are, who are afraid of barefoot running, they're worried about getting cuts or getting, stepping on rocks. Um, First of all, even if that was a concern, I think those are all like uh, very short term. You know, if I get a scratch or something, it'll heal in a week. If I blow out my knees, I'm done running forever. So I will trade the short term for the long term anytime. But even then, you know, uh, and this again to my wife's chagrin, um, your feet get tough, right? And uh, uh, you know, there there is a good book actually. Uh, there's probably more good books since I read them. But uh, Ken Bob, Barefoot Ken Bob Saxton, mm -hmm. um, he's an interesting guy. But I think his book captures uh, the right way to describe running, barefoot running to somebody better than any other I've seen. I mean, my commute is already a little crazy. Um, what are we talking about here? What, what, uh, what distance are we talking about? Well, I live about 12 miles from MIT but you can find lots of different ways to get there. So, I mean, I've run there for a long, many years, I've biked there. Um, Both ways? Yeah, but normally I would try to run in and then bike home, bike in, run home. But you have run there and back before? Sure. Barefoot? Yeah, uh, yeah, or with minimal shoes or whatever that. 12, 12 times two? Yeah. Okay. It's, it became kind of a game of how can I get to work? I've rollerbladed, I've done all kinds of weird stuff, but um, my favorite one these days is I've been taking the Charles River to work. So um, I can put in a little rowboat not so far from my house, but the Charles River takes a long way to get to MIT. So um, I can spend a long time getting there. And it's, you know, it's not about, I don't know, it's just about, uh, I've had people ask me, how can you justify taking that time? Uh, but for me, it's just a magical time to think, to compress, decompress. Um, you know, especially I'll wake up, do a lot of work in the morning, and then I kind of have to just let that settle before I'm ready for all my meetings. And then on the way home, it's a great time to let it, sort of let that settle. I would say I'm not a fast runner particularly. Probably my fastest splits ever was when I had to get to daycare on time because they were going to charge me, a, you know, some, some dollar per minute that I was late. Uh, I, I've run some fast splits to daycare. Uh, <laughs> But that those times are past now. Um, I think work, uh, you can find a work-life balance in that way. I think you just have to. Um, I, I think I am better at work because I take time to think on the way in. So I plan my day around it. Um, and I, I, I rarely feel that those are really in, at odds. To win. If, not to. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna like take a dinghy across the Atlantic or something if that's what you want. But uh, uh, but if someone does and wants to write a book, I would totally read it because I'm a sucker for that kind of thing. No, I, I do have some fun things that I will try. Yeah. You know, I like to when I travel, I almost always bike to Logan Airport and fold up a little folding bike on, and then take right. it with me and bike 
to wherever I'm going. And I've, it's taken me, or I've take, I'll take a stand up paddle board these days on, on the airplane and then I'll try to paddle around where I'm going or whatever. And I've done some crazy things, but, um, I think it's become the opposite. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> so you're like that dynamical system that the, the walker, the efficient, uh, yeah, it's, uh, leave no pain, right? Uh, you should end feeling better than you started. Okay. But, um, it's mostly, I think, and COVID has tested this because I've lost my commute. I think I'm perfectly happy walking around uh, around town with my wife and uh, kids if they could get them to go. Uh, and it's more about just getting outside and getting away from the keyboard for some time just to let things compress. I think I've been lucky to experience something that not so many roboticists have experienced, which is to hang out with some really amazing control theorists. <laughs> and um, the clarity of thought that some of the more mathematical control theory can bring to even very complex, messy looking problems is really, it really had a big impact on me and, and, uh, I had a day even a, just a couple of weeks ago where I had spent the day on a Zoom robotics conference, having great conversations with lots of people. Felt really good um, about the ideas that were flowing and and the like. And then I had a you know late afternoon meeting with a one of my favorite control theorists, and um, and we went from these from these abstract discussions about maybes and what ifs and and what a great idea to these super precise statements about systems that aren't that much more simple or, or abstract than the ones I care about deeply. And the contrast of that is, um, yeah, I don't know, it, it really gets me. I think people underestimate um, maybe the power of clear thinking. Uh, and so for instance, Deep learning is amazing. Um, I use it heavily in our work. I think it's changed the world unquestionable. It makes it easy to get things to work without thinking as critically about it. So I think one of the challenges as an educator is to think about um, how do we make sure people get a taste of the more rigorous thinking that I think goes along uh, with, with some different approaches. That's tough. That's a tough example because, I mean, the learning... Humans are involved. <laughs> not just because human, but I, I think um, the learning mantra is that basically the statistics of the data will tell me things I need to know, right? And, uh, you know, for the example you gave of all the nuances of, um, you know, eye contact or hand gestures or whatever that are happening for these subtle interactions between pedestrians and traffic... Right, maybe the data will tell the st they'll tell that story. I maybe even I, I, uh, one level more meta than than what you're saying. Um, for a particular problem, I think it might be the case that data should tell us the story. But I think there's a rigorous thinking that is just an essential skill for a mathematician or an engineer. That um, I just don't want to lose it. Yes. There are there are certainly super rigorous um, rigorous control or sorry uh, machine learning people. I just think deep learning makes it so easy right. to do some things that um, our next generation are um, not immediately rewarded for going through some of the more rigorous approaches. And then I wonder where that takes us. I just, well, I'm I'm actually optimistic about it. I just want to uh, do my part to try to steer that rigorous thinking. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are times where problems that can be solved with well-known, mature methods um, could also be solved with uh, with a deep learning approach. And um, there's an argument that 
you must use learning even for the parts we already think we know because if the human has touched it then you've 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 biased the system and you've some, suddenly put a bottleneck in there that is your own mental model but something like inverting a matrix you know i i think we know how to do that pretty well even if it's a pretty big matrix and we understand that pretty well and you could train a deep network to do it but you shouldn't probably <laughs> I think, you know, it, taking a class on analysis is all I'm so, or sort of arguing right. is to take, take a chance to stop and, and force yourself to think rigorously about even, you know, the rational numbers or something, you know, it doesn't have to be the end all problem, but that exercise of clear thinking, I think, uh, goes a long way. And I just want to make sure we, we keep preaching. <laughs> that's the good stuff, right? Um, that's how you understand the fundamentals? I think so. I think I, I, maybe even that's a key to intelligence or something. But I mean, if, okay, what if Newton and Galileo had deep learning? And, <laughs> and, and they had done a bunch of experiments and they told the world, here's your weights yeah. of your neural network. I've, we've solved the problem. Yeah. You know, where would we be today? I don't, I don't think we'd be as far as we, as we are. There's something to be said about having a, the simplest explanation for a phenomenon. So I don't doubt that we can train neural networks to predict even physical, um, you know, uh, F equals MA type equations. But um, I maybe, I, I want another Newton to come along because I think there's more to do in terms of coming up with the simple models for more complicated tasks. <laughs> So oh, sorry. I actually think um, learning is probably a route to, to achieving this. Um, but the representation matters, right? And I think uh, having a function that takes my inputs to outputs uh, that is arbitrarily complex may not be the end goal. I think um, there's still, you know, the most simple or parsimonious explanation for the data. Um, simple doesn't mean low dimensional. That's one thing I think that we've a lesson that we've learned. So, you know, a standard way to do um, model reduction or system identification and controls is to, the typical formulation is that you try to find the minimal state dimension realization of a system that hits some error bounds or something like that. And that's maybe not, I think we're, we're, we're learning that that was, that dim state dimension is not the right metric. Of complexity. Of complexity. But for me, I think a lot about contact, the mechanics of contact. If a robot hand is picking up an object or something. And when I write down the equations of motion for that, they are they look incredibly complex, not because um, actually not so much because of the dynamics of the hand when it's moving, but it's just the interactions and when they turn on and off. right? So having a high dimensional, you know, but simple description of what's happening out here is fine. But if when I actually start touching, if, I write down a different dynamical system for every polygon on my robot hand and every polygon on the object, whether it's in contact or not, with all the combinatorics that explodes there, then that's too complex. So I need to somehow summarize that with a more intuitive physics way of, of thinking. And uh, yeah, I'm very optimistic that machine learning will get us there. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, so the DARPA Robotics Challenge, it came on the tails of the DARPA Grand Challenge and DARPA Urban Challenge, which were the challenges that brought us, um, put a spotlight on self-driving cars. Um, Gil Pratt was at DARPA and pitched a new challenge that involved disaster response. Um, it didn't explicitly require humanoids, although humanoids came into the picture. This happened shortly after the Fukushima disaster in Japan. And our challenge was motivated roughly by that, because that was a case where if we had had robots that were ready to be sent in, there's a chance that we could have um, averted disaster. And certainly after the, um, in the disaster response, there were times where we would, love, we would have loved to have sent robots in. So in practice, what we ended up with was a, a grand challenge, a DARPA robotics challenge. Um, 
where Boston Dynamics was uh, was to make humanoid robots. People like me and the the amazing team at MIT um, were competing first in a simulation challenge to try to be one of the ones that wins the right to work on one of the uh, the Boston Dynamics humanoids in order to compete in the the final challenge, which was a physical challenge. And at that point, it was already so it was decided as humanoid robots. Early so on. there were there were two tracks. There were, you could enter as a hardware team where you brought your own robot. Or you could enter through the virtual robotics challenge as a software team that would try to win the right to use one of the Boston Dynamics robots. Sure. We didn't really know for sure what we were signing up for, um, in the sense that you could have had something that, as it was described in the call for participation, um, that could have put a huge emphasis on the dynamics of walking and not falling down and walking over rough terrain. Or the same description, because the robot had to go into this disaster area and turn valves and and uh, pick up a drill, cut the hole through a wall. It had to do some interesting things. The challenge could have really highlighted perception and autonomous planning, or it, it ended up that you know locomoting over a complex uh, terrain played a pretty big role in the competition. So. Uh, and the degree of autonomy wasn't clear. The degree of autonomy was always a central part of the discussion. So um, what wasn't clear was how we would be able, to, how far we'd be able to get with it. So the idea was always uh, that you want semi-autonomy, that you want the robot to have enough compute that you can have a degraded network link to a human. And so the same way you, we had degraded networks at, uh, at many natural disasters, you'd send your robot in you'd be able to get a few bits back and forth, but you don't get to have enough potentially to fully uh, operate the robot, every joint of the robot. So, and then the question was, and the gamesmanship of the organizers was to figure out what we're capable of, push us as far as we could, so that um, it would differentiate the teams that put more autonomy on the robot and had a few clicks and just said, go there, do this, go there, do this, versus someone who's picking every footstep or something like that. I mean, this was a defining experience for me. I, I, it, was, it came at the right time for me in my career. I had gotten tenure before I was due a sabbatical. And most people do something, you know, relaxing and restorative you, for a sabbatical. So you got tenure before, the, the, before this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a good time for me. I had, I had, we had a bunch of algorithms that we were very happy with. We wanted to see how far we could push them. And this was a chance to really test our mettle, to do more proper software engineering. Um, the team, we all just worked our butts off. We, you know, we're in that lab almost all the time. Um, okay, so there, I mean, there were some, of course, high highs and low lows throughout that. Uh, anytime you're, you know, not sleeping and devoting your life to a 400 pound humanoid. Um, I, I remember actually one funny moment where we're all super tired. And so Atlas had to walk across cinder blocks. That was one of the obstacles. And I remember Atlas was powered down and hanging limp, you know, on the, on its harness. And the, the humans were there like laying, you know, picking up and laying the brick down so that the robot could walk over it. And I thought, what is wrong with this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> we've got a robot just watching us do all the manual labor so that it can take its little, um, you know, <laughs> stroll across the terrain. Yeah. But, um, uh, <laughs> I mean, even the, even the virtual robotics challenge was, was super nerve wracking and dramatic. I, I remember... Um, so, so we were using gazebo as a simulator, uh, on the cloud and there was all these interesting challenges. I think, um, the investment that, that OSR, um, FC, whatever they were called at that time, Brian Gerke's team at open source robotics, um, they were pushing on the capabilities of gazebo in order to scale it to the complexity of these challenges. So, um, you know, up to the virtual competition. So the virtual competition was you will sign on at a certain time and we'll have a network connection to another machine on the cloud that is running the simulator of your robot. And your controller will run on this comp this controller, this computer, and, and the physics will run on the other and you have to, to connect. Now, um, the physics, they wanted it to run at real-time rates. 
because there was an element of human interaction um, and humans could, if you do want to tele up, it works way better if it's at frame rate. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. But it was very hard to simulate these, compl these complex scenes at real time rate. So right up to like days before the competition, the, the simulator wasn't quite uh, at real time rate. And that was great for me because my controller was solving a big, pretty big optimization problem. <laughs> And it wasn't quite at real-time rate. So I was fine. I was keeping up with the simulator. We were both running at about 0.7. And I remember getting this email. And by the way, the perception folks on our team hated that. I, that They knew that if my controller was too slow, the robot was going to fall down. And, and you know, no matter how good their perception system was, if I can't make my controller fast. Enough. Anyways, we get this email like three days before the virtual competition. Well, you know, It's for all the marbles. We're going to either get a humanoid robot or we're not. Mm -hmm. And we get an email saying, good news. We made the robot, the, the simulator faster. It's now <laughs> one point. And uh, I, we're, I was just like, oh man, what are we going to do here? So yeah. um, that came in late at night for me. Um, a few days ahead. A few days ahead. I went over, there was, it happened that Frank Permenter, who's a uh, very, very sharp, he's a, he was a student at the time um, working on optimization. Was He was still in lab. Uh, Frank, we need to make... <laughs> this quadratic programming solver faster, not like a little faster. It's actually, you know, um, and we wrote a new solver for that QP together that night. <laughs> so, um, I mean, your observation is almost spot on. What well, what we did was what everybody, I mean, people know how to do this, but we had not yet done this idea of warm starting. So we are solving a big optimization problem at every time step. But if you're running fast enough, the optimization problem you're solving on the last time step is pretty similar to the optimization you're going to solve at the next. Got it. We had, of course, had told our commercial solver to use warm starting, but even the interface to that commercial solver was causing us these delays. So what we did was we basically wrote, we called it fast QP at the time. Um, we wrote a very lightweight, very fast layer, which would basically check if nearby solutions to the quadratic program were, which were very easily checked, uh, could stabilize the robot. And if they couldn't, we would fall back to the solver. You couldn't really test this well, right? Um, or like, I mean, it, so we always knew that if we fell back to, if we, it got to the point where if for some reason things slowed down and we fell back to the original solver, the robot would actually literally fall down. Um, so it was, it was a, harrowing sort of edge we were, ledge we were sort of on. But I mean, it, it actually like the, the 400 pound humanoid could come crashing to the ground if you, if you, if your solver's not fast enough. But you know, the, we had lots of good experiences. I, I'll... I think, I think you got it right. I mean, I think the causality is not that we work hard and I think other disciplines work very hard too, but it's, I don't think it's that we work hard and therefore we are happy. I think we found something that we're truly passionate about. And it makes us very happy. And then we get a little involved with it and spend a lot of time on it. Um, what a luxury to have something that you want to spend all your time on, right? I mean, it really did teach me something fundamental about what it's going to take to get robustness out of a system of this complexity. I would say the DARPA challenge really um, was foundational in my thinking. I think the autonomous driving community thinks about this. I think lots of people thinking about safety critical systems that might have machine learning in the loop are thinking about these questions. For me, the DARPA challenge was the moment where I realized, you know, we've spent every waking minute running this robot and again, the, in, for the physical competition, days before the competition, we saw the robot fall down in a way it had never fallen down before. I thought, you know, how could we have found that? You know, we, we only have one robot. It's running almost all the time. We just didn't have enough hours in the day to test that robot. Something has to change, right? And, and I think that, I mean, I would say that the team that won uh, was, was from KAIST was the team that had two robots and was able to do not only incredible engineering, just absolutely top rate engineering, but also they were able to test at a rate and um, discipline that we didn't keep up with. 
Yeah. I mean, I think there's a whole philosophy to testing. There's the unit tests and you can do that on a hardware. You can do that in a, a small piece of code. You write one function, you should write a test that, that checks that function's input and outputs. You should also write a integration test at the other extreme of, of running the whole system together, you know, where that, that try to turn on all of the different functions that you've you think are correct. It's much harder to write the specifications for a system level test, especially if that system is as complicated as a humanoid robot. But the philosophy is sort of the same. On the real robot, um, it's it's no different, but on a real robot, it's impossible to run the same experiment twice. So if you if you see a failure, you hope you caught something in the logs that tell you what happened, but you'd probably never be able to run exactly that experiment again. And right now, I think our philosophy is just basically Monte Carlo uh, estimation is just uh, run as many experiments as we can, maybe try to set up the environment to, uh, to make the things we are worried about happen as often as possible. But really we're relying on somewhat random search in order to test. Maybe that's all we'll ever be able to, but I think, uh, you know, cause there's an argument that the things that'll get you are the, the the things that are really nuanced in the world. And it'd be very hard to, for instance, put back in a simulation. So I can tell you exactly what happened on our, we, I contributed one of those, our team contributed one of those spectacular falls. Um, every one of those falls, the, has a complicated story. I mean, at one time the power effectively went out on the robot because it had been sitting at the door waiting for a green light to be able to proceed and its batteries, or, you know, and therefore it just fell backwards and smashed its head to ground, its ground and it was hilarious, but it wasn't because of bad software, right? Um, but for ours, so the hardest part of the challenge, the hardest task in my view was getting out of the Polaris. It was actually relatively easy to drive the Polaris. We had We, we kind of joke, we call it the big robot little car problem because um, somehow the race organizers decided to give us a 400 pound humanoid. And then they also provided the vehicle, which was a little Polaris. And the, the robot didn't really fit in the car. So you couldn't drive the car with your feet under the steering column. You, we actually had to straddle the the main column of the uh, and have basically one foot in the passenger seat, one foot in, in the driver's seat, and then drive with our left hand. But the hard part was we had to then park the car, get out of the car. Uh, it didn't have a door. That was okay. But it's just uh, getting up from crouched, from sitting, when you're in this very constrained environment. Yeah. So we had a, you know, you think of... Um, NASA's operations and they have these checklists, you know, pre-launch checklists and the like. We weren't far off from that. We had this big checklist. And on the first day of the competition, we were running down our checklist. And one of the things we had to do, we had to turn off the controller, the piece of software that was running that would drive the left foot of the robot in order to accelerate on the gas. And then we turned on our balancing controller. And the nerves jitters of the first day of the competition, someone forgot to check that box and turn that controller off. So um, we used a lot of motion planning uh, to figure out a, a, a sort of configuration of the robot that we could get up and, and over. We relied heavily on our balancing controller. And, and basically, there were, when the robot was in one of its most precarious, you know, sort of configurations, trying to sneak its big leg out of the, out of the side, the other controller that thought it was still driving told its left foot to go like this. And, uh, and that wasn't good. Um, <laughs> but, but it turned disastrous I, for us because, um, what happened was a little bit of push here. Actually, if you, we have videos of us, you know, running into the robot with a 10 foot pole and it kind of will recover, but this is a case where there's no space to recover. So a lot of our secondary balancing mechanisms about like take a step to recover, they were all disabled because we were in the car and you, there's no place to step. So we were relying on our just lowest level reflexes. And even then, I think just hitting the foot on the seat, uh, on, the, on the floor, we probably could have recovered from it. But the thing that was bad that happened is when we did that and we jo jostled a little bit, the tailbone of our robot had, was only a little off the seat, it hit the seat. And the other foot came off the ground just a little bit. 
Uh, and nothing in our plans had ever told us what to do if your butt's on the seat and your feet are in the air. Feet in the air. And then <laughs> the thing is, once you get off the script, things yeah. can go very wrong because even our state estimation, our system that was trying to collect all the data from the sensors and understand what's happening with the robot, it didn't know about this situation. So it was predicting things that were just wrong. And then we did a violent shake and phew, fell off and our uh, face first on out of the robot. No, so that's, um, that is one of the big challenges. And I think it's still true, um, uh, you know, Boston Dynamics and, and um, Animal, and there's this incredible work on, on legged robots happening around the world. Most of them still are, are very good at the case where you're making contact with the world at your feet. And they have typically point feet relatively, their balls on their feet, for instance. If, that, if those robots get in a situation where the elbow hits the wall or something like this, that's a pretty different situation. Now, they have layers of mechanisms that will make, I think, the, the more mature solutions have, have ways in which the controller won't do stupid things. But a human, for instance, is able to leverage incidental contact in order to accomplish a goal. In fact, I might, if you push me, I might actually put my hand out and make a new, brand new contact. The feet of the robot are doing this on, on quadrupeds, but we mostly in robotics are afraid of contact on the rest of our body, which is crazy. There's this whole field of motion planning, collision-free motion planning. And we write very complex algorithms so that the robot can dance around and make sure it doesn't touch the world. <laughs> um, awesome. It's a nice description of it. So there's also an opponent in there, right? So, so if very dynamic, right? If you are wrestling a human and uh, are in a game theoretic situation with the human, that that's still hard. Uh, but just to speak to the you know quickly reasoning about contact part of it, for instance. Yeah, maybe even throwing the game theory out of it, almost right. like a, yeah, almost like a non-dynamic opponent. Right. There's reasons to be optimistic, but I think our best understanding of those problems are still pretty hard. Um, I have been increasingly focused on manipulation, partly where that's a case where the contact has to be much more rich. Um, and there are some really impressive examples of, of deep learning policies, controllers that, um, that can appear to do good things through contact. We've even got new examples of, of, you know, deep learning models of predicting what's going to happen to objects as they go through contact. But I think the challenge you just offered there still eludes us, right? The, the ability to make a decision based on those models quickly, um, you know, I have to think though, it's hard for humans too, when you get that complicated. I think probably you had maybe a slow motion version of where you learned the basic skills and you've probably gotten better at it. And, and, um, there's, there's much more subtlety, but it might still be hard to actually, you know, really on the fly, take a, you know, model of your humanoid and figure out how to, how to plan the optimal sequence. That might be a problem we never solve. Yeah, I think there's hierarchy and composition yeah. um, probably in the systems that we don't capture very well yet. Uh, you, you have layers of control systems. You have reflexes at the bottom layer and you have a, you know, a system that's capable of you know, planning a vacation to some distant country, which is probably, you probably don't have a controller, a policy for every possible destination you'll ever pick, right? Um, but there's something magical in the in-between and how do you go from these low-level feedback loops to something that feels like a pretty complex set of outcomes. You know, my guess is, I think, I think there's evidence that you can plan at some of these levels, right? So uh, Josh Tenenbaum just showed it in his talk the other day. He's got a game he likes to talk about. I think he calls it the pick three game or something where he puts a bunch of clutter down in front of uh, a person and he says, okay, pick three objects. And it might be a telephone or a shoe or a Kleenex box or whatever. Um, 
and apparently you pick three items and then you pick, he says, okay, pick the first one up with your right hand, the second one up with your left hand. Now using those objects, those now as tools, pick up the third object, right? So that's down at the level of, of physics and mechanics and contact mechanics that, um, that I think we do learning or we do have policies for, we do control for almost feedback, but somehow we're able to still, I mean, I've never picked up a telephone with a shoe and a water bottle before and somehow, and it takes me a little longer to do that the first time, but most of the time we can sort of figure that out. So yeah, I think the, the amazing thing is this ability to be flexible with our models, right. um, plan when we need to use our well-oiled controllers when we don't, when, when we're in familiar territory. Um, having models, I think the, the other thing you just said was something about, I think your awareness of what's happening is even changing as you, as you get, as you improve your expertise, right? So maybe you have a very approximate model of the mechanics to begin with. And as you gain expertise, you get a more refined version of that model. You're aware of of muscles or, or uh, balance components that you were just weren't even aware of before. So how do you scaffold that? I mean, it's very hard to, to say one thing is harder than one, some problems harder than the other. What probably matters is, um, who, who, who started the organization that, that, I mean, I think RoboCup has a pretty serious following and there is a history now of people playing that game, learning about that game, building robots to play that game, building increasingly more human robots. It's got momentum. And so if you want to, uh, to have mixed martial arts compete, you better start your, or, start your organization, organization now, right? Um, I think almost independent of which problem is technically harder because they're both hard and they're both different. I mean, I guess there is robo sumo wrestling. There's like the robo one competitions um, where they do have these robots that go on a table and basically fight. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you have to make the rules very carefully, right? <laughs> I mean, if, if, if Atlas kicked me in the shins, I'm down and uh, you know, and, and game over. So there's, you know, it's, it's very subtle on. Yeah, I think. In soccer right i mean as soon as there's contact or whatever <laughs> and there's there are some things that the robot will do better I, I think if you really set yourself up to try to see could robots win the game of soccer as the rules were written the right thing for the robot to do is to play very differently than a human would play it's you're not going to get you know the perfect soccer player robot you're going to get something that exploits the rules exploits its super actuators it's super low bandwidth um you know feedback loops or whatever and it's going to play the game differently than you want it to play yeah um and it i bet there's ways there's i bet there's loopholes right we saw that in the in the darpa challenge uh, that that it's very hard to write a set of rules that someone can't find uh a way to exploit it's funny i i i never watched the episode I know when it happened though, because I gave a talk to some MIT faculty one day on a uh, unassuming, you know, Monday or whatever, I was telling them about the state of robotics. And I showed some video of, from Boston Dynamics of the quadruped spot at the time. Uh, it was the early version of spot. And there was a look of horror that went across the room. <laughs> and I said, what, you know, I've, 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 I've shown videos like this a lot of times, what happened? And it turns out that this video had gone, yeah, this Black Mirror episode had changed the way people watched, um, yeah, the videos I was putting out. Right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not a psychologist. Um, <laughs> I think, I don't know exactly why, uh, people react the way they do. Um, I think, I think we have to be careful about the way robots influence our society and the like. I think that's something that's a responsibility that roboticists need to embrace. Um, I don't think robots are going to come after me with a kitchen knife or a pellet gun right away. And I mean, they, if they were programmed in such a way, but I used to joke with Atlas that, um, 
all I had to do was run for five minutes and its battery would run out. <laughs> but uh, actually, they've, they've got a very big battery in there by the end. So it was over an hour. Um, <laughs> I think the fear is a bit cultural though. Because I, I mean, you notice that, like I think in my age in the US, we grew up watching Terminator, right? If I had grown up at the same time in Japan, I probably would have been watching Astro Boy. And there's a very different reaction to robots uh, in different countries, right? So I don't know if it's a human innate fear of metal marvels or if it's um, um, something that we've done to ourselves with our sci-fi. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think technology is um, complicated. It can be used in many ways. I think there are purely software um, attacks that somebody could use to do great damage. Maybe they have already. Um, you know, I think, uh, wheeled robots could be used in bad ways too. Drones. Uh, drones, right. Um, I don't think that, let's see, I don't want to be, um, building technology just because I'm compelled to build technology and I don't think about it. But I would consider myself a technological optimist, I guess, um, in the sense that I think we should continue to create and evolve and our world will change. Um, and if we're, we will introduce new challenges, we'll screw something up maybe, but I think also we'll invent ourselves out of those challenges and life will go on. So it's interesting because you you didn't mention like this is technically too hard. I don't think robots are. I think people attribute a robot that looks like an animal as maybe having a level of self awareness or or consciousness or something that they don't have yet, right? So it's not. I think our ability to anthropomorphize those robots is probably um, we're assuming that they have a level of intelligence that they don't yet have, and that might be part of the fear. So in that sense, it's too hard, but, um, you know, there are many scary things in the world, right? So, uh, I think we're right to ask those questions. We're right to, um, think about the implications of our work. It's an important question. Um, I actually, I think I like Rod Brooks answer maybe the best on this. I think, and it's not the only answer he's given over the years, but maybe one of my favorites is, um, he says, it's not going to be, he's got a book, Flesh and Machines, I believe. Um, it's not going to be the robots versus the people. We're all going to be robot people <laughs> because, um, you know, we already have smartphones. Some of us have, um, serious technology implanted in our bodies already, whether we have a hearing aid or a pacemaker or anything like this. Um, uh, people with amputations might have prosthetics. Um, that's a trend I think that is likely to continue. I mean, this is now uh, wild speculation, but uh, I mean, when do we get to cognitive implants and the like? And Yeah, uh, and it might not even be implanted part of us, but just it's so much a part of our, yeah, our society. Yeah, I mean, I think the the way we interact with each other online is changing the value we put on, you know, personal interaction, and that's a crazy big change that's going to happen and rip through our has already been ripping through our society, right? And that has implications that are massive. I don't know if they should be scared of it or go with the flow, but, um, I don't see, you know, some battle lines between humans and robots being the first thing to worry about. I completely agree. I think Boston Dynamics is absolutely awesome. I think, uh, I show my kids those videos, you know, and I, the best thing that happens is sometimes they've already seen them, you know, uh, Right, I think, I, I just think it's a pinnacle of success in robotics that um, is just one of the best things that's happened. Uh, absolutely, completely agree. Oh, 
I think um, you can't just look at the failures. You can, all, I mean, Boston Dynamics is a success. There's yeah. lots of companies that are still doing amazingly good um, work in robotics. I mean, this is the uh, this is the capitalist ecology or something, right? I think you have many companies, you have many startups, and they push each other forward, and many of them fail, and some of them get through, and that's sort of the natural um, way of things. Way of those things. I don't know that. Is robotics really that much worse? I, I feel the pain that you feel too. Every time I read one of these, I um, sometimes it's friends and and uh, uh, I definitely wish it went better or went differently. But I think it's healthy and good to have um, bursts of ideas, bursts of activities. Uh, ideas, if they are really aggressive, they should fail sometimes. Um, certainly that's the research mantra, right? If you're succeeding at every problem you attempt, then you're not choosing aggressively enough. Is it exciting to you, uh, the new spot? Oh, it's, oh, you gonna, it's so good. When are you getting him as a pet uh, or it? Yeah, I mean, I have to dig up <laughs> 75K right now. But, uh, I mean, it's I so do, cool that there's a price tag, you can go and and then actually buy it. And I have a Skydio R1, uh, love it. So, um, no, I, I would, I would, I would absolutely be a customer. Uh, I wonder what your kids would think about it. I, I actually, um, Zach from Boston Dynamics would let my kid drive in one of their demos one time. And uh, that was just so good. Uh, so good. And, so and again, I'll forever kind of... be grateful for that. <laughs> I like Mine. that. Yeah, I think that's right. I think... You know, there's something that humans seem to do, or maybe in my dangerous introspection, is uh, I think we are able to make very simple models that assume a, a lot about the world very quickly. And then uh, it takes us a lot more time, like you're wrestling. You know, you probably thought you knew what you were doing with wrestling, and you were fairly functional as a complete wrestler, and then uh, you slowly got more expertise. So maybe uh, it's natural that our first first level of defense against seeing a new robot is to think of it in our existing models of how humans and animals behave. And it's just, and as you spend more time with it, then you'll develop more sophisticated models that will appreciate the differences. What is a robot? What is a robot? I think I robotics... ridiculous questions. No, no, it's good. Um, I mean, there's standard definitions of combining computation with some ability to do mechanical work. I think that gets us pretty close. But I think uh, robotics has this problem that once things really work, we don't call them robots anymore. Like your my dishwasher at home is pretty sophisticated, beautiful mechanisms. There's actually a pretty good computer, probably a couple of chips in there doing amazing things. We don't think of that as a robot anymore which isn't fair because then what roughly it means that robots robotics uh, always has to solve the next problem and uh, doesn't get to celebrate its past successes. I mean, even factory room floor robots are super successful. They're amazing, but that's not the ones, I mean, people think of them as robots, but they don't, if you, if you ask what are the successes of robotics, somehow it doesn't come to, to your mind immediately. So the definition of robot is, uh, a system with some level of automation that fails frequently. <laughs> Something like it's a, <laughs> it's the computation plus mechanical work uh, and uh, unsolved problem. <laughs> <laughs> so there are many different types of robots. The control that you need for uh, um, a Jibo robot, you know, some some robot that's sitting on your countertop and and interacting with you but not touching you, for instance is very different than what you need for an autonomous car or an autonomous drone. Uh, it's very different than what you need for a robot that's gonna walk or pick things up with its hands, right? My um, passion has always been for the places where you're interacting more, you're doing more dynamic interactions with the world. So walking, now, now manipulation. And the control problems there are are beautiful, I think, Contact is one thing that differentiates them from many of the control problems we've solved classically, right? The 
modern control grew up stabilizing fighter jets that were passively unstable. And there's like amazing success stories from control all over the place. Um, power grid. I mean, there's all kinds of, it's, it's, it's everywhere, uh, that we don't even realize just like I, AI is now. So you mentioned contact, like what's contact? So uh, an airplane is an extremely complex system or a spacecraft landing or whatever, but at least it has the luxury of, um, things change relatively continuously. That's an oversimplification, but if I make a small change in the command I send to my actuator, um, then the path that the robot will take tends to take a change only by a small amount. And there's a feedback mechanism here. That's and what we're talking about. there's a feedback mechanism. And thinking about this as locally, like a linear system, for instance, I can use more linear algebra tools to study systems like that, generalizations of linear algebra to, to these smooth systems. What is contact? The robot um, has something very discontinuous that happens when it makes or breaks, when it starts touching the world. And even the way it touches or the order of contacts can change the outcome in potentially unpredictable ways. Uh, not unpredictable, but uh, complex ways. I, I do think there's a little bit of a... Um, a lot of people will say that contact is hard in robotics, even to simulate. Um, and I, I think there's a little bit of a, there's truth to that, but, but maybe a misunderstanding around that. So what is limiting is that when we think about our robots and we write our simulators, we often make an assumption that, that objects are rigid. And when it comes down, you know, that they, that their mass moves all, you know, stays in a constant position relative to each other itself, um, and, and that leads to some, some paradoxes when you go to try to talk about rigid body mechanics and contact. And so for instance, if I have a three-legged stool with just a, imagine it comes to a point at the, at the legs. So it's only touching the world at a point. If I draw my physics, uh, my high school physics diagram of this system, then there's a couple of things that I'm given by, by elementary physics. I know if the system, if the table is at rest, if it's not moving, it's zero velocities. That means that the normal force, all the forces are in balance. So the, the force of gravity is being countered by the forces that the ground is pushing on my table legs. I also know since it's not rotating that there, that the moments have to balance. And since it can in, it's a three dimensional table, it could fall in any direction. It actually tells me uniquely what those three normal forces have to be. If I have four legs on my table, four-legged table, um, and they were perfectly machined to be exactly the right same height, and they're set down and the table's not moving, then the basic conservation laws don't tell me there are many solutions for the forces that the ground could be putting on my legs that would still result, result in the table not moving. Mm. Now, the reason that seems fine, I could just pick one. But it gets funny now because if you think about friction... What we, th what we think about with friction is we, our, our standard model says the amount of force that you're, that the table will push back. If I were to now try to push my table sideways, I guess I have a table here, um, is proportional to the normal force. Hmm. So if I have, if I'm very barely touching and I push, I'll slide, but if I'm pushing more and I push, I will, I'll slide less. It's called Coulomb friction is our standard model. Now, if you don't know what the normal force is on the four legs, and you push the table, then you don't know what the friction forces are going to be. Right. And so you can't actually tell. The laws just don't aren't explicit yet about which way the table's going to go. It could veer off to the left. It could veer off to the right. It could go straight. So the rigid body assumption of contact leaves us with some paradoxes, which are annoying for, for writing simulators and for writing controllers. We still do that sometimes because soft contact is potentially harder numerically or whatever. And the best simulators do both or do some combination of the two. But, but anyways, because of these kind of paradoxes, there's, there's all kinds of paradoxes in contact, uh, mostly due to these rigid body assumptions. It becomes very hard to like write the same kind of control laws 
that we've been able to be successful with for like fighter jets, we haven't been as successful writing those controllers for manipulation. And so you don't know what's going to happen at the point of contact, at the moment of contact. There are situations absolutely where you where our laws don't tell us. So the standard approach, that's okay. I mean, instead of having a differential equation, you end up with a differential inclusion, it's called. It's a set valued equation. Mm -hmm. It says that I've, I'm in this configuration. I have these forces applied on me. Um, and there's, there's a set of things that could happen, right? And um, the non-smooth comes in when I make or break a new contact first or when I transition from stick to slip. So you typically have static friction and then you'll start sliding and that'll be a discontinuous change in, in velocity, for instance, especially if you come to rest or then. Uh. Control has an answer for this. Robust control is one approach, but, but roughly you can write controllers which try to still perform the right task despite all the things that could possibly happen. The world might want the table to go this way and this way, but if I write a controller that um, pushes a little bit more and pushes a little bit, I can certainly make the table go in the direction I want. It just puts a little bit more of a burden on the control system, right? And these discontinuities do change the control system because um, the way we write it down right now, every different control con configuration, including sticking or sliding or parts of my body that are in contact or not, looks like a different system. And I think of them, I reason about them separately or differently, and the combinatorics of that blow up, right? So I just don't have enough time to compute all the possible contact configurations of my humanoid. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I, I mean, I'm a humanoid. I have lots of degrees of freedom, lots of joints. I only, I've only been around for a handful of years. It's getting up there, but um, I haven't had time in my life to visit all of the states in my system, certainly all the contact configurations. So if step one is to consider every possible contact configuration that I've ever, I'll ever be in, that's probably, a, uh, that's probably not a problem I need to solve, right? Uh the simplest example maybe would be, imagine a, a robot with a flat foot. And we think about the phases of gait where the heel strikes and then the, fore, the front toe strikes and then you can heel up, toe off. Those are each different contact configurations. I only had two different contacts, but I ended up with four different contact configurations. Now, right. of course, I might have, my, my robot might actually have bumps on it or other things, so it could be much more subtle than that, right? But it's just even with one sort of box interacting with the ground already in in the plane <laughs> has that many right and if i was just even a 3d foot then it probably my left toe might touch just before my right toe and things get subtle now if i'm a dexterous hand and i go to talk about just grabbing a water bottle if every if i have to enumerate every possible order that my hand came into contact with the with the bottle then I'm dead in the water. I, my, my, any approach that we were able to get away with that in walking, because we mostly touch the ground within a small number of points, for instance, and we haven't been able to get dexterous hands that way. So I think simulating contact is one aspect. And I, people often say that we don't, that one of the reasons that we have a limit in robotics is because we do not simulate contact accurately in our simulators. And I think that is, the extent to which that's true is partly because our simulators, we haven't got mature enough simulators. There are some things that are still hard, difficult, that we should change. Um, but, but we actually, we know what the governing equations are. They have some foibles like this indeterminacy but we should be able to simulate them accurately. We have incredible open source community in robotics, but it actually just takes a professional engineering team a lot of work to write a very good simulator like that. Uh. Right, so Drake is the simulator that, that I've been working on. 
Um, there are other good simulators out there. I don't like to think of Drake as just a simulator because because we write our controllers in Drake, we write our perception systems a little bit in Drake, but we write all of our our you know low level control and even planning and optimization in so it has optimization capabilities absolutely well. yeah i mean drake is three things roughly it's an optimization library which is um sits on it it, it provides a layer of abstraction in c plus plus and python for commercial solvers you can write linear programs quadratic programs you know semi-definite programs some of squares programs the ones we've used mixed integer programs and it will do the work to curate those and send them to a, whatever the right solver is, for instance. And it provides a level of abstraction. The second thing is, is a system modeling language, a bit like LabVIEW or Simulink, where you can make block diagrams out of complex systems. Or it's, it's like ROS in that sense, where, uh, where you might have lots of ROS nodes that are each doing some part of your system. But to contrast it with ROS, um, we try to write, if you write a Drake system, then you have to, um, it asks you to describe a little bit more about the system. If you have any state, for instance, in the system, any variables that are going to persist, you have to declare them. Parameters can be declared and the like. But the advantage of doing that is that you can, if you like, run things all on one process, but you can also do control design against it. You can do I mean, simple things like rewinding and playing back your your um, your simulations, for instance. You know, these things you, you get some rewards for spending a little bit more upfront cost in describing each system. Um, and and I I was inspired to do that because I think the complexity of Atlas, for instance, um, is just so great. And I, I think although I mean, Ross has been incredible, absolute huge fan of what it's done for the robotics community, but it. Um, the ability to rapidly put different pieces together and have a, a functioning thing is very good. But I do think that it's hard to think clearly about a bag of disparate parts, Mr. Potato Head kind of software stack. And um, if you can, you know, ask a little bit more out of each of those parts, then you can understand their, the way they work better. You can try to verify them and the like. Um, or you can do learning against them. And then one of those systems, the last thing, I, I, I said the first two things that Drake is, but the, the last thing is that there is a, a set of multi-body equations, rigid body equations, that is trying to provide a system that simulates physics. And that um, we also have renderers and other things, but I think the physics component of Drake is, is special in the sense that um, we have done a, a excessive amount of engineering to, to make sure that we've written the equations correctly. Every possible tumbling satellite or spinning top or anything that we could possibly write as a test is, is tested. Um, we are making some, you know, I think fundamental improvements on the way you simulate contact. So, so it was really interesting that what happened was that um, we started getting more professional about our software development during the DARPA Robotics Challenge. I learned the value of software engineering and how these, how to bridle complexity. I guess that's, that's what I, I want to somehow fight against and bring some of the clear thinking of controls into these complex systems we're building for robots. Um, shortly after the DARPA Robotics Challenge, uh, Toyota opened a research institute, T, T, TRI, Toyota Research Institute. Um, they put one of their, there's, there's three locations. One of them is just down the street from MIT. And, uh, and I helped ramp that up, uh, right out, uh, as a part of my, uh, the end of my sabbatical, I guess. Um, so, so TRI is, uh, has given me the TRI robotics effort has made this investment in simulation in Drake and Michael Sherman leads a team there of just absolutely top-notch dynamics experts that are trying to write those simulators that can pick up the dishes. And there's also a team working on manipulation there that is taking problems like loading the dishwasher. And we're using that to study these really hard corner cases kind of problems in manipulation. So for me, this, um, you know, simulating the dishes, I mean, we could actually write a controller. If we just cared about picking up dishes in, in the sink once, we could write a controller without any simulation whatsoever, and we could call it done. 
But we want to understand like what is the path you take to actually get to a robot that could perform that for any dish uh, in anybody's kitchen with with enough confidence that it could be a commercial product, right? And and it has deep learning perception in the loop. It has complex dynamics in the loop. It has controller. It has a planner. And how do you take all of that complexity and put it through this engineering discipline and verification and validation process to actually get enough confidence to deploy? I mean, the, the DARPA challenge made me realize that that's not something you throw over the fence and hope that somebody will harden it for you, that there are really fundamental challenges in uh, in closing that last gap. They're doing the validation the, and the testing. I think it, it might even change the way we have to think about the way we write systems. Um, what happens if you, if you have the robot running lots of tests it, and it screws up, it breaks a dish, right? How do you capture that? I said, you can't run the same simulation or the same experiment twice in, in a real, on a real robot. Do we have to be able to bring that one-off ex- failure back into simulation in order to change our controllers, study it, make sure it won't happen again? Do we, is it enough to just try to add that to our distribution and understand that on average, we're going to cover that situation again? There's like really subtle questions at the corner cases that uh, I think we don't yet have satisfying answers for. Yes. I mean, I think we have to get better at that. I mean, control theory has um, for for decades talked about active experiment design. Um, What's that? So people call it curiosity these days. It's roughly this idea of trying to exploration or exploitation, but, but in the active experiment design is even, is, is more specific. You could try to, um, understand the uncertainty in your system, design the experiment that will provide the maximum information to reduce that uncertainty. If you, there's a parameter you want to learn about, what is the optimal trajectory I could execute to learn about that parameter, for instance, um, scaling that up to something that has a deep network in the loop and a planning in the loop it's tough. We've done some work on, um, you know, with Matt O'Kelly and Amancina, we've, we've worked on um, some falsification algorithms that are trying to do rare event simulation that try to just hammer on your simulator. And if your simulator is good enough, you can, um, you can spend a, a lot of time, uh, or you can write good algorithms that try to spend most of their time in the corner cases. So you basically imagine you're, you're building uh, an autonomous car and you want to put it in, I don't know, downtown New Delhi all the time, right? An accelerated testing. If you can write sampling strategies, which figure out where your controller is performing badly in simulation and start generating lots of examples around that, you know, it's just the space of possible places where that can be, where things can go wrong is very big. So it's, it's hard to write those algorithms. Man. that's going to be important for robots too. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's another massive theme at, at Toyota research for robotics is this fleet learning concept is, um, you know, the idea that I, as a humanoid don't have enough time to visit all of my States, right? There's just a, it's very hard for one robot to experience all the things, but that's not actually the problem we have to solve, right? Um, we're going to have fleets of robots that can have very similar appendages. And at some point, maybe collectively, they have uh, enough data that their computational processes should be set up differently than ours, right? <laughs> <It's> a... <laughs> yep, there's a big there's a big group working on multiple groups working on home robotics. It's a major part of the portfolio. Awesome. There's also a couple other projects and advanced materials discovery um, using. AI and machine learning to discover new materials for um, for car batteries and, and the oh, like, for instance. Yeah, cool. and that's been actually an incredibly successful team. Uh, there's new projects starting up too. So, yeah, I, th- I think we already have Roombas cruising around. We yeah. have uh, uh, you know Alexas or Google Homes on their our kitchen counter. 
it's only a matter of time till they spring arms and start doing something use, useful like that. Um, so I do think it's coming. I think it's, it, lots of people have lots of motivations for doing it. It's been super interesting actually learning about Toyota's vision for it, which is about helping people age in place. Um, cause I think that's not necessarily the first entry, the most lucrative, um, entry point, but it's the problem maybe that, um, we really need to solve no matter what. And, uh, so I think, I think there's a real opportunity. It's a delicate, um, problem. How do you work with people, help people, keep them active, engaged, you know, um, but improve their quality of life and, uh, and, and help them age in place, for instance. Yeah. Uh, so it's an exciting space. I think it's a really important space. I do feel like, you know, a few years ago, uh, drones were successful enough in academia. They kind of broke out and started an industry and autonomous cars have been happening it does feel like manipulation uh, in logistics, of course, first, but in the home shortly after seems like one of the next big things that's going to really pop. Yeah. So what's soft robotics? I th so um, I told you that I, I really dislike the fact that robots are afraid of touching the world all over their body. So there's a couple of reasons for that. If you, if you look carefully at all the places that robots actually do touch the world, they're almost always soft. They have some sort of pad on their fingers or a rubber sole on their foot. Um, but if you look up and down the arm, we're just pure aluminum or something. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that makes it hard actually. In fact, hitting the table with your, you know, your rigid arm or nearly rigid arm, uh, is a, is a, it has some of the problems that we talked about in terms of simulation. I think it, it fundamentally changes the mechanics of contact when you're soft, right? You, you turn point contacts into patch contacts, which can have torsional friction. You can have, um, distributed load. If I want to pick up an egg, right? If I pick it up with two points, then in order to put enough force to sustain the weight of the egg, I might have to put a lot of force to break the egg. If I envelop it with a, with contact all, all around, then uh, I can distribute my force across the shell of the egg and have a better chance of not breaking it. So soft robotics is for me a lot about changing the mechanics of contact. Does it make the problem a lot harder? Um, uh, <laughs> quite the opposite. Uh, it, it changes the computational problem. I think because of the, I think our world and our mathematics has biased us towards rigid I see. But it really should make things better in some ways, right? Um, it's it's a. I think the 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 future is unwritten there. Um, but the other thing it can do ultimately. Sorry to interrupt, but I yeah. think ultimately it will make things simpler if we embrace the softness of the world. It makes um, it makes things smoother, right? So the the ah. the result of small actions is less discontinuous, but it also means potentially less, you know, instantaneously bad, for instance. I won't necessarily contact something and send it flying off. The other aspect of it that just happens to dovetail really well is that if soft robotics tends to be a place where we can embed a lot of sensors too. So if you change your, um, your hardware and make it more soft, then you can potentially have a tactile sensor, which is measuring the deformation um, so there's a team at, at, at TRI that's working on soft hands and, uh, and you get so much more information if you, you can put a camera behind the skin roughly and, and get fantastic tactile information, which is, um, it's super important. Like in manipulation, one of the things that really is frustrating is if you work super hard on your head mounted, on your perception system for your head mounted cameras. And then you've identified an object, you reach down to touch it. And the first, the last thing that happens right before, right at the most important time, you stick your hand and you're occluding your head mounted sensors, right? So in all the part that really matters, um, all of your offboard sensors are, you know, are occluded. And really, if you don't have tactile information, then you're, you're blind in an important way. So it happens that soft robotics and tactile sensing 
uh, tend to go hand in hand. Right. So under actuator robotics is my graduate course. It's it's online mostly now. So, uh, I mean, in the sense that the Several lectures versions are the, of it, I think. Right. It's the YouTube really great. I recommend it highly. Look on YouTube for the 2020 versions until March, and then you have to go back to 2019, thanks to COVID. Um, no, I've, I've poured my heart into that class. Um, and lecture one is basically explaining what the word underactuated means. So people are very kind to, to show up and then maybe have to learn what the title of the course means over the course of the first lecture. That, that first lecture is really good. <laughs> you should watch it. <laughs> thanks. It's a, it's a strange name, but um, I thought it captured the essence of what control was good at doing and what control was bad at doing. So what do I mean by underactuated? So um, a mechanical system uh, has many degrees of freedom, for instance. I think of a joint as a degree of freedom. And it has some number of actuators, um, motors. So if you have a robot that's bolted to the table that has five degrees of freedom and five motors, then you have a fully actuated robot. If you have, if you take away one of those motors, then you have an underactuated robot. Now, why on earth? I, ha I have a good friend who, who likes to tease me. He said, Russ, if you had more research funding, would you work on fully actuated robots? <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, the answer is no. The, the world gives us underactuated robots, whether we like it or not. I'm a human. I'm an underactuated robot, even though I have more muscles than my big degrees of freedom, because I have, in some places, uh, multiple muscles attached to the same joint. But still, there's an, a really important degree of freedom that I have, which is the location of my center of mass in space, for instance. <laughs> All right, I'm, I can jump into the air, and there's no motor that connects my center of mass to the ground in that case. So I have to think about these impl the implications of not having control over everything. The passive dynamic walkers are the extreme view of that, where you've taken away all the motors and you have to let physics do the work. But it shows up in all of the walking robots where you have to use some of actuators to push and pull even the degrees of freedom that you don't have an actuator on. That's referring to walking if you're like falling forward. Like, is there a way to walk that's fully actuated? So it's a subtle point. When you're, when you're in contact and you have your feet... Um, on the ground, there are still limits to what you can do, right? Be unless I have suction cups on my feet, I cannot accelerate my center of mass towards the ground mm. faster than gravity because I can't get a force pushing me down, right? But I can still do most of the things that I want to. So you can get away with basically thinking of the system as fully actuated unless you suddenly needed to accelerate down super fast. But as soon as I take a step, I, I get into to more nuanced territory. And to get to really dynamic robots or airplanes or uh, other things, um, I think you have to embrace the underactuated dynamics. Manipulation, people think, is manipulation under underactuated? My, even if my arm is fully actuated, I have a motor, if my goal is to control the position and orientation of this cup, then I don't have an actuator for that directly. So I have to use my actuators over here to control this thing. Now it gets even worse. Like, what if I have to button my shirt? Okay. What are the degrees of freedom of my shirt? Right. I suddenly, <laughs> that's a hard question to think about. Yeah. It kind of makes me queasy as a uh, thinking about my state space control ideas. Um, but actually, those are the problems that make me so excited about manipulation right now is that it, it breaks some of the, um, it breaks a lot of the foundational control stuff that I've been thinking about. <laughs> So I think the philosophy there is let physics do more of the work. The technical approach has been optimization. So you typically formulate your decision-making for control as an optimization problem, and you use the language of optimal control and sometimes numer often numerical optimal control in order to make those decisions and balance um, you know, these complicated equations of and in order to control. You don't have to use optimal control to do underactuated systems, but that has been the technical approach that has borne the most fruit in our, at least in our line of work. 
Right. Right around the time of the DARPA challenge, we had a complicated perception system in the DARPA challenge. We also started to embrace perception for our flying vehicles at the time. We had a, a really good project on trying to make airplanes fly at high speeds through forests. Mm -hmm. um, Sir Tosh Karaman was on that project and uh, we had a, it was a really fun team to, to work on. He's carried it farther, much farther forward since then. And so, that's yes. using cameras for perception? So that was using cameras. Uh, that was, a, at the time we felt like LIDAR was too too heavy and too power uh, heavy to, to be carried on a, on a light UAV and we were using cameras. And that was a big part of it was just how do you do even stereo matching at a fast enough rate with a small camera, uh, a small onboard compute. Since then, we have now, the, so the deep learning revolution unquestionably changed what we can do with perception for robotics and control. So in manipulation, we can address, we can use perception in, a, I think, a much deeper way. And um, we get into not only, I think the, the first use of it naturally would be to ask your deep learning system to look at the cameras and produce the state, which is like the pose of my thing, for instance. But I think we've quickly found out that that's not always the right thing to do. Um, Why is that? Because what's the state of my shirt? Imagine I've-, it's I've Very noisy, you mean? Or, it's, it's, um, or just if the first step of me trying to button my shirt is estimate the full state of my shirt, <laughs> including like what's happening in the back here, yeah. or whatever, whatever, yeah. that's just not the right. Yeah. Uh, specification. There are aspects of the state that are very important to the task. There are many that are unobservable and not, not important to the task. So you really need, it's a, it begs new questions about state representation. Another example that we've been playing with in lab has been just the idea of chopping onions, mm -hmm. okay? Or carrots, it turns out to be better. So the onions stink up the lab. Uh, <laughs> And they're hard to see in a camera, but uh, so <laughs> the details matter. Yeah, details matter. You know, so um, if, I, if I'm moving around a particular object, right, then I think about oh, it's got a position or an orientation in space. That's the description I want. Now, when I'm chopping an onion, okay, like the first chop comes down, I have now a hundred pieces of onion. Does my control system really need to understand the position and orientation and even the shape of the hundred pieces of onion in order to make a decision? Probably not, you know, and I, if I keep going, I'm just getting more and more. Is my state space getting bigger as I cut? <laughs> it's, it, um, it, it's not right. So somehow do do? there's a, I think there's a, a richer uh, idea of state. It's not the state that is given to us by Lagrangian mechanics. There is a, um, there is a proper Lagrangian state of the system, but the relevant state for this um, is some latent state is what we call it in machine learning. But, um, you know, there's some some different state representation. Like some compressed representation. Some, And that's what I, I, I worry about saying compressed because it doesn't, I don't mind that it's low dimensional or not, but it has to be something that's easier to think about. By us humans. Or my algorithms, or, or the, the algorithms being like control, optimal. Control. So, for instance, if the contact mechanics of all of those onion pieces and the, all the permutations of possible touches between those onion pieces, you know, you can give me a high dimensional state representation. I'm okay if it's linear, yeah. but if I have to think about all the possible shattering combinatorics of that, <laughs> then my robot's going to sit there thinking, and uh, the soup's going to get cold or something. <laughs> Underactuated is a way of life, man. <laughs> exactly. Um, I guess that's what I'm asking. <laughs> I, I, I do think it's everywhere. I think some, in some places, um, we already have natural tools to deal with it. You know, it rears its head. I mean, in linear systems, it's not a problem. We just, we just like a, an underactuated linear system is really not sufficiently distinct from a fully actuated linear system. It's, it's a, it's a subtle point about when that becomes a bottleneck in what we know how to do with control. It happens to be a bottleneck, um, although we've gotten incredibly good solutions now. But for a long time, that I felt that that was the key bottleneck 
in legged robots. And roughly now the under actuated course is, you know, me trying to tell people everything I can about how to make Atlas do a backflip, right? Um, I have a second course now in that I teach in the other semesters, which is on, on manipulation. And that's where we get into now more of the, that's a newer class. I'm hoping to put it online this fall um, completely. And uh, that's going to have much more aspects about these perception problems and the state representation questions. And then how do you do control? And the, the thing that's a little bit sad is that, uh, for me at least, is a, there's a lot of manipulation tasks that people want to do and should want to do. They could start a company with it and be very successful that don't actually require you to think that much about underact or dynamics at all, even, but certainly underactuated dynamics. Once I have, if I if I reach out and grab something, if it if I can sort of assume it's rigidly attached to my hand, then I can do a lot of interesting, meaningful things with it, without really ever thinking about the dynamics of that object. So they've built we've built systems that kind of um, reduce the need for that, enveloping grasps and the like. Um, but I think the really good problems in manipulation. So I, manipulation, by the way, is more than just pick and place. That's like a lot of people think of that, just grasping. I don't mean that. I mean buttoning my shirt. I mean tying shoelaces. Tying How do you shoelaces. program a robot to tie shoelaces? And not just one shoe, but every shoe, right? That's a really good problem. It's tempting to write down like the infinite dimensional state of the, of the laces. <laughs> That's probably not needed to write a good controller. I know we could hand design a controller that would do it but I don't want that. I want to understand the principles that would allow me to solve another problem that's kind of like that. But I think if we can stay pure in our approach, then the challenge of tying anybody's shoes is a great challenge. I think it's super important. Let's even just in a practical sense, if we forget about the emotional part of it, um, but for robots to interact safely while they're doing meaningful mechanical work in the pro in the uh, you know close contact with or vicinity of people that need help i think we have to have them they have we have to build them differently um they have to be afraid not afraid of touching the world so uh i think baymax is just awesome that's just the, like the, the 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 movie of big hero 6 and the the concept of baymax that's just awesome i think we should um and we have some folks at, at Toyota that are trying to, Toyota Research, that are trying to build Baymax roughly. And uh, uh, I think it's a, just a fantastically good project. Um, I think it will change the way people physically interact. The same way, I mean, you, you gave a couple examples earlier, but, but if, I, um, if the robot that was walking around my home looked more like a teddy bear and a little less like the Terminator, that could change completely the way people perceive it and interact with it and... Maybe they'll even want to teach it, like you said, right? You could um, not quite gamify it, but somehow instead of people judging it and looking at it as if uh, it's not doing as well as a human, they're going to try to help out the cute teddy bear, right? Who knows? But I, I think we're building robots wrong and being more soft and more contact is important, right? <laughs> I mean, I think when you're in on the details, then we, we of course, anthropomorphized our work with Atlas, but in, you know, in verbal communication and the like, I think we were pretty aware of it as a machine that needed to be respected. Um, I actually, I worry more about the smaller robots that could still, you know, move quickly if programmed wrong. And, uh, and we have to be careful actually about safety and the like right now. And that, if we build our robots correctly, I think then those a lot of those concerns could go away. And we're seeing that trend. We're seeing the lower cost, lighter weight arms now that could be fundamentally safe. Um, I mean, I, I do think touch is so fundamental. I, Ted Adelson is uh, is great. He's a perceptual scientist at MIT. Uh, and he studied vision most of his life. And he said, uh, when I had kids, I expected to be fascinated by their perceptual development. But what really 
what he noticed was felt more impressive, more dominant was the way that they would touch everything and lick everything and pick things up, <laughs> stick it on their tongue and whatever. Yeah. And he said, um, watching his daughter, uh, convinced him that actually he, he needed to study tactile sensing more. So there's something very, um, important. I think it's, it's a little bit also of the passive versus active, uh, part of the world, right? You can passively perceive the world. Um, but it's fundamentally different if you can do an experiment, right? <laughs> and if you can change the world and you can learn a lot more than a passive observer. So you can, in dialogue, you, that was your initial example, you mm -hmm. could have an active experiment exchange. But I think if you're just a camera watching YouTube, I think that's a very different problem than if you're a robot that can apply force and touch. I, I, I think it's important. Yeah. I, I, it's not my area, but I am also a big believer. Do you have an emotional connection to Alice? <laughs> like, yeah, do you miss him? I, I mean, um, <laughs> yes. I, I, I don't know if I'd more so than if I had a different science project that I'd worked on super uh. hard, right? I, but, uh, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the robot, we basically had to do heart surgery on the robot in the final competition because we melted the core. Um, and, uh, and yeah, there was something about watching that robot hanging there. We know we had to compete with it in an hour and it was getting its guts ripped out. Um, yeah, so um, I actually didn't read that much as a kid, but I read fairly voraciously now. Um, there are some recent books that if you're interested in this kind of topic, um, like AI Superpowers by Kai-Fu Lee is just a fantastic read. I, you, you must read that. Um, Yuval Harari is just, I think that can open your mind. Um, Sapiens. Sapiens is, is the first one. Homo Deus is the second, yeah. I th we mentioned The Black Swan by Taleb. I think that's a good you know, sort of mind opener. I actually, um, so so there's maybe a more controversial recommendation I could give. Um, Great. Well, I we love so, controversy. <laughs> in some sense, it's it's so classical it might surprise you. But I actually recently read um, Mortimer Adler's uh, How to Read a Book. Mm. Not so long. It was a while ago. But um, some people hate that book. I loved it. I think... We're in this time right now where, um, boy, we're just inundated with research papers that you could read on archive with uh, limited peer review and, and just this wealth of information. Um, I don't know. I think the passion of um, what you can get out of a book, a really good book or a really good paper, if you find it, the attitude, the realization that you're only going to find a few that really are worth all your time. Um, but then once you find them, you should just dig in and, and, and understand it very deeply. And it's worth, you know, marking it up and, and, uh, you know, having the hard copy writing in the, the side notes, side margins. Um, I think that was really, it, I read it at the right time where I was just feeling just overwhelmed with, really low quality stuff, I guess. Um, and similarly, uh, I'm giving more than three now. I'm sorry if I've exceeded no. my, <laughs> my <laughs> quota. Yeah, I think when you really find uh, something which a, a book that resonates with you might not be the same book that resonates with me, but, um, when you really find one that resonates with you, I think the dialogue that happens and it, that's what I loved that Adler was saying, you know, I think Socrates and Plato say, um, the, the written word is never going to capture the beauty of dialogue. Right. But Adler says, no, no, um, a, a, a really good book is a dialogue between you and the author and it crosses time and space. And, uh, 
I don't know. I think it's a very romantic. There's a bunch of like specific advice which you can just gloss over, but the romantic view of how to read and really appreciate it is 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 so good. Yeah. And similarly, teaching. I um, I thought a lot about teaching, and uh, and so Isaac Asimov, great science fiction writer, has also actually spent a lot of his career writing nonfiction. Right, his memoir is fantastic. He was passionate about explaining things, right? He wrote all kinds of books on all kinds of topics in science. He was known as the great explainer. And some, you know, I, I do really resonate with his style and, uh, and just his way of talking about, you know, by communicating and explaining to something is a really the way that you learn something. I think I think about problems very differently because of the way I've been given the opportunity to teach them at MIT and have questions asked, you know, the, the fear of the lecture, the experience of the lecture and the questions I get and the interactions just forces me to be rock solid on, on these ideas in a way that if I didn't have that. I, I don't know. I would be in a different intellectual space. I do think that something's changed right now, which is, you know, Right now we're giving lectures over Zoom. I mean, giving seminars over Zoom and everything. Um, I'm trying to figure out, I think it's a new medium. Every lecture is a, is a I'm sorry, every seminar even, I think every talk I give, I, I, I you know, is an opportunity to, to give that differently. I can, I can deliver content directly into your browser. You have a WebGL engine right there. I could, I can throw, 3d uh content into your browser while you're listening to me right yeah and i can assume that you have a you know at least a powerful enough laptop or something to watch zoom while i'm doing that while i'm giving a lecture that that's a that's a new communication tool that i didn't have last year right and uh i think robotics can potentially benefit a lot from teaching that way we'll see it's going to be an experiment this it's fall a, it's I'm, interesting I'm thinking a lot about it <laughs> Not be, all of them. <laughs> okay. It but could be it could be painful. Yeah. And to see like how how to improve. So do you find that uh, I know you segment your um your podcast? Do, do you think that helps people with the the attention span aspect of it, or is it? I think it's an interesting time to be a kid these days. everything points to this being sort of a winner take all economy and the like i think the people that will really excel in my opinion are going to be the ones that can think deeply about problems um you have to be able to ask questions agilely and use the internet for everything it's good for and stuff like this and i think a lot of people will develop those skills i think the the leaders thought leaders, you know, robotics leaders, whatever, are going to be the ones that can do more and they can think very deeply and critically. Um, and that's a harder thing to learn. I think one, one path to learning that is through mathematics, through engineering. Um, I would encourage people to start math early. I mean, I didn't really start. I mean, I, I was always in the the better math classes that I could take, but I wasn't pursuing super advanced mathematics or anything like that until i got to mit i think mit lit me up and uh really started the life that i'm living now but um yeah i, I really want kids to to dig deep really understand things building things too i mean pull things apart put them back together like that's just such a good way to really understand things and expect it to be a long journey, right? It's, uh, you don't have to know everything. You're never going to know everything. So think deeply and stick with it. <laughs> Enjoy the ride, but just Enjoy. make sure you're not, um, yeah, just, just make sure you're, you're, you're stopping to think about why things work. We're overwhelmed with content right now, but you have to stop and pick some of it and, and really understand.
Well, I guess I just said that um, at least my current life begins began when I got to MIT. If I have to go farther than that. Yeah, what was was there a life before MIT? Oh, absolutely. But but let me actually tell you what happened when I first got to MIT because that I think might be relevant here. But I, uh, you know, I I had taken a computer engineering degree at Michigan. I enjoyed it immensely. Learned a bunch of stuff. I was I liked computers. I've liked how to pr liked programming. Um, but when I did get to MIT and started working with Sebastian Sung, theoretical physicist, computational neuroscientist. Um, the culture here was just different. Um, it demanded more of me, certainly mathematically and in the critical thinking. And I remember the day that I, uh, borrowed one of the books from my advisor's office and walked down to the Charles river and was like, I'm getting my butt kicked, you know? Um, and I think that's going to happen to everybody who's doing this kind of stuff, right? I think, uh, I expected you to ask me the meaning of life. You know, I think that the, uh, um, somehow I think that's, that's gotta be part of it. This doing hard things. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you consider quitting at any point? Did you consider this isn't for me? No, never that. I mean, I was, I was Stop working person. hard, but I was loving it. Right. I mean, there's, I think the, there's this magical thing where you, uh, you know, I'm lucky to surround myself with people that basically I, almost every day I'll, I'll, I'll see something, I'll be told something or something that I realize, wow, I don't understand that. And if I could just understand that there's, there's a, something else to learn that if I could just learn that thing, I would connect another piece of the puzzle. And, and, uh, you know, I think that is just such an important aspect and being willing to understand what you can and can't do and and loving the journey of going and learning those other things. I think that's the best part. This is the Lex Free Podcast.